really delighted by the turnout today. I think you're going to enjoy this talk. I heard a section of this talk several years ago when I attended the uh, Oakwood um, Historical Society's annual meeting. Mark Grizzly is actually a neighbor. He's a street behind me, and uh, he just was reelected to a third non-consecutive term as president of the board of the uh, Oakwood Historical Society. I worked with that group for several years, but have been so busy with work here and three kids that uh, I haven't really been able to do much. But each August, there's a classics on the lawn car show. If you like cars at all, Mark, it's really his brainchild. And I try to help him out a little bit over there with that. So uh, without much further ado, I will tell you that he has a background in commercial aviation and just has a real interest, a real passion for Oakwood, Oakwood history, Oakwood real estate. Um, he can probably tell you a little more about that. But um, anyway, like I say, so great to see you. And um, thank you. Thank you. As Alex mentioned, I am Mark Risley, and I am serving as president this year. Uh, so, as I don't know if anybody you know, any of you know, but never scratch your nose at a board meeting when you're looking for a president. So that's kind of how I got the job. So. <laughs> Um, first off, I'm going to apologize. I've come down with a cold over the weekend. And, I'm sorry, I'm going to try and keep, keep it away from you folks, but I may have to uh, take a little break here and there. My wife brought me in some hot tea, and I've got water here. Pop and cough drops. So we'll see how long I last here, hopefully, through the whole program. But we'll, we'll muddle through. Um, Again, I'm with the Oakwood Historical Society. I know you're all volunteers, and I know how valuable all of you are because none of us can do uh, anything for any of these organizations or for history without volunteers. I myself am a volunteer at the Historical Society. You may think it's a paid job being in Oakwood, but it's not. <laughs> I just had a panic call from our vice president a few minutes ago about the uh, bank account. So. <laughs> So I know uh, I know that you're all you're all hard workers and you're passionate about what you do or you wouldn't be doing it for free. So my thanks to all of you for that. Uh, if we could have the lights out there, thank you. Can everybody see this? Okay. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Okay for the time being. Yeah. And Mark, Steve is bringing you a small microphone, which oh, might okay. help you. All right. Thank you. Yeah. yeah it, uh, might help if uh, if my voice begins to falter here. <coughs> This is presentation, classic architecture of Oakwood. It's going to be about 80 to 90 minutes, depending on uh, questions and answers. Now, uh, it's informal, so if you see something here, you have a question, I'm usually scanning the audience. Uh, just to, And if you have a question, just raise your hand, and I'll, uh, we'll just kind of hit it on the spot, and that kind of eliminate a Q&A at the end of it. But feel free to ask a question at the end, too. Now, um, the first thing we're going to do, you all got the Schaefer Heights tour guides. This is also a little bit of an architectural guide, too, to some of the housing stock. I, I'm sorry, I apologize, but I was unable to bring the uh, Sean's Park. We were kind of running out of those, but we are having later this year, and I believe in August or September, we're going to have a, a walking tour of the uh, Sean's Park, and we'll have more of those available at that time. Oakwood had some prominent architects uh, for early Oakwood. Uh, Oakwood was uh, established, or was founded in 1908, and uh, a lot of people think it was because of the flood that created Oakwood, but it was not. It was the rail car. Once the rail cars were put in to go up into the Oakwood area, um, the uh, uh, that's when the growth really started taking off, and of course it was incorporated by 1908. The flood, some of the uh, developers actually uh, used it, the higher ground at Oakwood, as a uh, uh, selling point, but really didn't uh, do much to uh, increase what was a, a boom that was already going on. Uh, we'll look at, uh, we'll be mentioning several of these uh, uh, architects, particularly Louis Lott and um, uh, Albert Pretzinger and Ralph Rossell. These uh, tour booklets were provided, of course, by the Oakwood Historical Society, also with the Oakwood Rotary Foundation. If you're curious as to where Schaefer Heights uh, uh, is located, and I would encourage you to go up and either walk these neighborhoods on a nice day or um, 
uh, drive through on a bicycle if you like. But Oakwood High School will be located here. This is Sean's Avenue. Down here is Schaefer Boulevard. Schaefer Heights is not a very big area, but the uh, Oakwood Community Center there, Schaefer Park. The athletic field here and the uh, stadium is over here. So it's just these little pretty much four and a half blocks and uh, a lot of nice architecture there. Oakwood has always attracted the type of people with the desire and the wherewithal to maintain their property. So consequently, it is uh, a, a community full of well-preserved homes. Well, some of them are restored, some of them are remodeled or remodeled, as sometimes we say. But um, when uh, the uh, Oakwood uh, Historical Society uh, had applied to become a, 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 the uh, Shots Park Historic Shots Park District as a historic district. The uh, National Register of Historic Places stated that it was, uh, actually I've heard it was the finest uh, nominee that they'd ever had, but it was certainly one of the finest because these homes were all well preserved and maintained. A lot of communities will try to get that designation in order to draw funds in and attract people in to build up an area that has declined. But in Shonks Park, that uh, area was already well maintained and preserved. We're going to start off to looking at this first house. This is the, the st first style we're going to look at is Craftsman, and that was popular from 1900 to 1929. Can everybody hear me all right? I'm going to, I've got the microphone here if I need it. Um, and uh, the arts and crafts period in America was 1900 to about 1929. The revival started around 1966 and is still going strong today. So the revival period has lasted longer than the original arts and crafts period. And uh, oftentimes these were mentioned, at, or these are referred to as craftsman homes or arts and crafts homes. It's kind of an interchangeable uh, phrase. The 1900 to 1929, the main aspect of a craftsman home is what we call revealed construction. And that is when the construction values of the house are actually used for design. We see that when we see things like these uh, rafters, um, I'm sorry, we see these uh, roof brackets up here, which are usually kind of hidden, maybe in a different design, but they're usually not that visible up there. So it's what's known as revealed construction. You also see, and we'll look at this in the next picture, what's called uh, exposed rafter tails. Those are usually covered up underneath the, uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, those are usually covered underneath the eaves up there, but um, they are uh, exposed in a, in a craftsman style home. We're going to start at the top here. You're going to have a natural stone chimney and foundation. The whole idea of the arts and crafts movement was getting back to nature and handmade items. This house is not the proper color for a craftsman home. It's blue, but it has so many attributes to it. It's like a, I call it a sampler of architectural details. It has a clipped gable up here. You see where that's kind of chopped off. Uh, again, the, the chimneys and foundations would be a natural stone. These roof brackets or exposed rafter tails, we just talked about that a little bit. This is what's known as board and batten on the uh, exterior of the house. This is shingle on this floor. Down here, we get to clapboard. These little uh, supports here are called corbels, corbels. This is a bell cast eave. I don't know if you can see that or not, but this comes down and it kind of curves out. And that, we'll see it on another house here in a moment, but that kind of deflects some of the rainwater away from the foundation. So there's also, some of these are practical too. A lot of houses, craftsman style homes, have these roof brackets on them. And to kind of modernize the home in the 50s and the 40s, they would remove those roof brackets well, they found those, the ends of the roofs beginning to sag down. Those brackets were there as part of the actual structure. And there uh, were large beams for uh, porch roof support. So this is a, a craftsman style home, but it has many attributes we're gonna see in other styles homes as well. So, and that's Louis Lott, Louis Lott had designed that home. Mark, 
Yes. But you said the blue was not an acceptable. What colors were acceptable? It's more colors from nature, earth tones, greens, maybe kind of a, if you went for a red, it would be kind of a dusty rose, you know. Uh, colors from nature, so mostly earth tones and greens and browns and beiges. But uh, actually, looks pretty nice and blue. If you like blue, that's a good one. Yes, sir. Was Louis Lauder Daytonian? Uh, yes, he was, and I should know more of his history. He did study over in Europe, and we're going to see, I believe, some examples. We are. We're going to see some examples of his European influence uh, on some of his designs. Thank you. And he basically was the main um, designer for Sean's Park. If you go down Irving Avenue, almost all of those homes, on, actually on both sides of the street, the Dayton side and the Oakwood side, were Louis Lott homes. This is not a Louis Lott home. This is on Ford Boulevard, but it is a craftsman style home, and it's got some uh, pretty good attributes. We can see these exposed rafter tails here, and those are usually either up behind a, a fascia board or they're up underneath the, you know, the uh, overhangs there. Um, I like to use it. You see the big beams here as well. I like to use this house as an example because I have this photograph here. And this is that house being built in 1919. It's on Floor Boulevard, as you can see on the last photo. It's yellow. And here we are with the uh, the construction crew here. These are likely the uh, the developers. These guys are the uh, mostly journeymen um, craftsmen. And back then, you didn't have just cheap, low wage labor to come in to start throwing things up. You actually brought in a, a, a craftsman to build them. They they knew the science of the wood and the all the materials. They knew the design, the engineering, and architecture is a kind of a combination of art and engineering. And we're mostly going to look at the art side here today. But this is how a house like this would have been built. This is basically a tool wagon. Most of these parts probably came up in 1919 on the back of horse-drawn wagons most of the materials there. And uh, so these gentlemen, and they you know, look like they're going to help Marlo Hardy pull a piano up the long stretch of stairs. <laughs> They've got on their coveralls, but they got on their white shirts and their ties. Those will probably be dirty by the end of the day. And they broke for this uh, this photograph. This uh, cornfield out in the back, that's uh, that's the park back behind Light Light. Smith School would be back to um, these rooms here would be, uh, well, they're bedrooms, but this would be a den. This is more of a sleeping room in the winter time. You are in the summertime, you would uh, have a nice, well ventilated room that you would, before air conditioning, for where you can sleep at night. You may even want to go up here and pull a mattress out on the upper rail, and that would have been a sleep, sleeping room. Here are some craftsman details. I always like to say that craftsman style is uh, designs that are simple but not plain. You don't see a whole lot of uh, intricate, uh, you know, floral work here. Uh, what you have are some just some straight lines, some nice little touches. Here's another good shot of that of a knee brace uh, bracket there. Here's a little close up of the um, exposed rafter tails. And here's a nice chimney here. This this home is a Louis lot, and we'll see in the next slide. But you can see that it's got uh, a clapboard and uh, clapboard and shingle uh, finishing on it. It's got a pretty nice, a lot of this kind of what's referred to as high style arts and crafts. When they take a design and they kind of go over the top and really deck it out, that's referred to as high style. Here are some more uh, <coughs> craftsman style homes. I know that these two are Louis, I'm pretty sure that's Louis Lot. I know that one is. Um, and uh, this home, as I mentioned, the, the, the Arts and Crafts Revival, this home is on Hadley Road, just west of Far Hills, and that house is about four or five years old. But it was built in the Arts and Crafts style. If you're interested in that style, uh, there's three magazines out there that are very very uh, helpful, and that's American Bungalow, Style 1900, and Arts and Crafts Homes in the Revival. And 
the uh, American Bungalow is mostly about houses, style 1900 about decoration, uh, decorative arts, and then the arts and crafts homes and the revival about the newer styles of arts and crafts. We're going to look next at the English Tudor revival, and this has been, that was mostly popular 1890 to 1940. We still see that stuff. We get some but uh, it's mostly a lot of people take a look and they see these what's called half timbers and uh, a lot of times that that will direct you to an english tutor but they don't always have the uh, the half timbers the main point about an english tutor house is the steep roof lines and what's called a cross gable you'll have the main part of the house going here and you'll have another gable that crosses and comes out here at a 90 degree so uh, but, uh, this was a, it is a revival. And it was uh, inspired by 15th and 16th century styles. And uh, the term revival is actually kind of a Hollywood connection. Because uh, back in the day when these revivals, first a lot of revivals started in the early 1900s, people would go to these movies and they would see swashbucklers going through these English homes or the Spanish castles and things like that. They say, I'd like to have a house like that. So the styles kind of came back because of Hollywood and they became revival. So a lot of homes were inspired by such. Um, the outsides of these are usually in brick or stucco. And it's a hallmark of Oakwood architecture. We'll take a look at, at some of the public buildings as well, right here. Uh, our Oakwood City building, uh, this, the main part of the building goes there. There's that cross uh, gable. And uh, uh, here was the same thing here. This is Oakwood High School. That's the entranceway. That's a cross gable. Wright Memorial Library and Edwin D. Smith School. <coughs> it's not unusual to have slave roof up there. And uh, so if you get a chance to visit any of those places, we can go a little bit more. Yes? How do they shingle those things? The, the other house that you just showed was so steep. The roof was so steep. You would do it very carefully. <laughs> uh, they would actually have to put scaffolding up and just uh, kind of work their way down and then take the scaffolding down as, a, uh -huh. as they moved along. This is uh, this looks more like an asbestos roof, whereas uh, that may be shingle. But uh, this is definitely shingle. That's, uh, I, I live across the street from the school. Uh, so some old style shingle, the best shingle, uh, I'm sorry, a slate, I'm saying shingle, slate. Um, but the best slate generally come from New Hampshire. We're getting a lot of it now from China. This stuff is like a 90 to 100 year type of slate and uh, slate tiles, but uh, we're getting some of the cheaper stuff in from China. You can tell the difference <coughs> because China, uh, a slate from anywhere else in the world kind of has a little sparkle to it. But the good original New Hampshire, Vermont area slate doesn't have that. Aren't you learning anything? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Different things. I, I kind of tend to go off. There'll be a little history in here too. So. Uh, here are some tutor details. A lot of times you'll have some, some hand carvings. This is actually on uh, Smith School. Uh, this is what's known as the uh, Tudor Arch. It'll uh, come up here, curve in, and it'll make a little break up here at the top. And a lot of doorways are that way. In fact, you can see it back here at uh, Oakwood High School. A little bit here also at Smith, so you get the idea of that. These are what are called chimney pots, and those are made of clay. These are, are uh, highly decorative. These are very useful. What happens here is that the clay heats up much quicker than a brick on the inside. So when you start a fire in there, the heat goes up that chimney, is better absorbed by the clay, and the heat rises off of that, so it pulls in and makes that draw. Uh, the diamond pattern in, uh, in the uh, leaded glass windows is also another uh, obvious detail to your homes. There are some more uh, uh, homes in Oakwood that are uh, English Tudor, and uh, this is the original home of, of Lauren M. Berry, who's often attributed as the inventor of the Yellow Pages. He actually didn't invent them, he just came up with the current format that everybody uses. 
so he uh, he has a garage in the back of uh, I think there's a six or seven car garage. You, you like Cadillacs and you have them in the perfect day. <laughs> you made that turn. <laughs> and uh, so you can see the uh, the half timbers here. This one does not have half timbers, but it does have those cross gables. It's not in brick, it's in stucco, and uh, it does have the steep roof. This one more of a clay tile. Now there are different types of, uh, of tutors. This is a Jacobian, most of them we see or we're referred to as a Elizabethan. This is what's known as a Jacobian tutor. And uh, it uh, is more castle-like with these buttresses here and these, in, these battlements we see at the top of the roof on it. So it's kind of reminiscent of an actual old castle. And that's what's referred to as a Jacobian tutor, Jacobian. We also have the Germanic tutor. Now uh, this is more of a German style tutor. And uh, uh, one of the things we see here is the Gothic march, where it just kind of curves up. It doesn't, it kind of gradually curves up, doesn't come up and make that turn and then come to the point, it gradually curves up to the point. This was the home, uh, original home of Adam Schantz Jr. His father had the uh, the vision of Schantz Park, but he had passed away, and he passed that on to his son, uh, that vision, and the son then began developing, uh, in the early 1900s, began developing Schantz Park. It was really one of Dayton, if not the country's first suburbs. It was to get away from the noise and the dirt and the smoke of the city. and. Uh, and now the rail cars were in, people could actually commute a little bit. I mean, it would have been a pretty good commute by horse-drawn rail back then, and the electric rail cars came in. But uh, it would have been a little bit of a commute out, to, not too shots apart from downtown. This is one of my favorite styles of English tutor. It's called a Cotswold Cottage. And it's it really brings up a vision of uh, uh, kind of a whimsical storybook life. It's got cozy corners and artistic details. These two here are actually the same house with a different angle. So you see just these really nice little details. I mean, you almost see a full moon rising up back there and an owl in a tree, and, you know, Hansel and Gretel and smelling gingerbread <laughs> coming out of this doorway right here. So uh, a lot of artistic detail. Again, whimsical, almost like a storybook. Now this house was known as French Normandy Tudor, and that's basically very similar to an English or the uh, Cotswold Cottage, but the addition of this uh, turret here is um, is what makes that more of a Normandy style. Now uh, this was the original home of Dr. Gisbert L. Bossard. We all know who he is, right? No. no. Okay, here comes the history lesson. <laughs> got a call a couple of years ago from a gentleman in Eureka, California. He was originally from the Dayton, Cincinnati area, but his hobby was doorbells. And um, he called up and asked me if I could uh, call the Historical Society, and I called him back and asked if I could find the Normandy Castle and take a picture of it for him. And I said, sure, what's the deal? And uh, it was Dr. Gisbert L. Bossard. We looked around, it was kind of stymied, and kind of finally figured out where it was and where, which one it was. This is actually on Herman Boulevard. You know where the athletic field is there in Oakwood? It's between Sh uh, Schaefer and Hathaway Road, further down to Schroyer Road. And this, this house had actually been a uh, built around 1931 and um, it was actually a model home for the uh, I think it's called the Hodap Schaefer Platt in Oakwood and uh, it's an amazing house uh, but uh, they had built a few homes up there in English Tudor style but what happened around 1931 the depression sets in all the construction in Oakwood goes from about 700 years houses a year down to about five. Five houses, not five hundred. And uh, this home was already built and sitting kind of empty, but we had this uh, Dr. Gisbert L. Bossard 
he was an inventor, he was doing well at the time, so he comes in and he buys the house and he lives here. It's an amazing house, it still has its iron door on the side where the ice man would come and open up, put the ice in, close that, and it could open up on the other side, bring the ice in. <coughs> and uh, also has, uh, in one of the top rooms up there, there's a secret panel that opens up between two closets and two bedrooms. <laughs> But uh, it's a beautiful house. Uh, um, let's see, also take notice of the uh, Diana, uh, the Huntress up here. This is actually, even though this is a, uh, a Tudor style house, this is actually very Art Deco. And it is Diana the Huntress, if that's the, the wind vane uh, up there, weather vane. And you, you can't really see it that close, but it's uh, uh, Diana and Two dogs running. She has her hair. Oops, I can't read the little thing. In the that says Normandy Castle. Oh, okay. And that was the, the, the name of the house when they, the, uh, the style of the house when they developed, you know, when they built it. And that sign is still up. So uh -huh. it's, it's like a sales sign that's been there for yeah. 80 some years. So uh, I thought that that weather vane had been put up there more recently than 1931. But uh, no, it hasn't. We'll take a look. Here, but uh, Dr. Bossard was quite a character. He was very eccentric, kind of hard to get along with. So let me give you a little history on him. Uh, in 1911, uh, and I, I'm sorry I forget this gentleman's name, but he went into the uh, Mormon Cathedral and took photographs. And at that time, that was a big no-no. He kind of stuck in, took photographs. They, this gentleman, I believe, published them, and it was a big, quite a scandal in, uh, in uh, the country at that time. Remember, that was over 100 years ago. But, um, so he was kind of a character that way. He was a, a bubble off plum, not the coldest beer in the refrigerator, but he was uh, very intelligent, and uh, he understood things and he invented things. One of the first things he invented was the railroad flashing, railroad crossings. So that's one of his inventions. When you see this crawl up here at Times Square, uh, he had invented that. Remember, you, you always see that film, Japan Surrenders, right there in Times Square. He invented that. And he also invented the multi-child doorbell. So all of these inventions have this kind of an electrical breaker type of a, uh, uh, an idea to it. And uh, he developed a company called Telechime. And uh, here's an ad for them. And here's two ads for them. And um, you can see this is actually his home right here. And um, so he had invented that. And he, uh, this was one of the ads from 1936. That's the doorway to the, to the Normandy Castle. And this is an ad from 1936 with some folks coming home and ringing the doorbell. They're coming over to visit ringing the doorbell. So uh, actually the photos are reversed. This one was actually on that side, but since the ad had the photo reversed, I went ahead and reversed this. You can see it's the same stonework up here, same door. So that was very interesting. And uh, so here's uh, Here's the 1931, the, the home, and there is Diane, the Huntress. Uh, he was a front page of American Communist Magazine. Um, here's an ad for the Hodap uh, Schaefer section. Uh, Mossard buys beautiful home in Oakwood. Uh, the Normandy Castle passes in the hands of the president of the General Controller Company. That was his company that made Telechine uh, doorbell. Yes. Could you please use your microphone? And the nice lady over there had a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Somebody have a question? Oh, I was going to ask you about the connection with the doorbell, but you're answering that now, oh, so okay. that's fine. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. It's I'm there. sorry. All right, so, uh, and this swimming pool is still back behind uh, the house. And of course, even though you're a big nerd in the lab coat, you still collect the chicks out by the swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> see uh, Mr. Bosart or Dr. Bosart there. Now he went on to join a partnership with a uh, gentleman down in Cincinnati 
and they created a company called Newtone, N-U-T-O-N-E. So you're all familiar with Newtone doorbells, and now they have other products as well. In the history of Newtone, this, this guy was so hard, Dr. Bossard was so hard to get along with, but in the history of, Bossard, of Newtone, they merely refer to, a, to him as the gentleman from Dayton. <laughs> they don't even want to call him by name. <laughs> Uh, here's a, another last picture. Uh, this is High Acres. This was David L. Reich of Reich's uh, Cooper Company. And this was their designer showcase house for the Dayton Philharmonic uh, Volunteer Association. Many of you probably saw that. And uh, that's their website. I'm not sure if they're doing one this year or not. Usually they do it every other year, but sometimes uh, they'll do it every year and do kind of a lesser home. We're looking for a house. I'm not sure we're going to have one. Oh, okay. Oh, then you're from there. Okay, terrific. Hopefully you can find another good one because those are uh, terrific, uh, terrific jobs. That we love going to this every year. This estate was known as High Acres. Back in the day, many of these estates had these names. And I, I know I'm talking to a bunch of historians here, but I'll tell you. But they had these names, and those were your addresses. And uh, uh, somebody would, would uh, write a letter to David L. Reich and would just say, Mr. David L. Reich, High Acres, Dayton, Ohio, and the postman knew right where it went. Same with Hawthorne Hill and uh, some of the other homes around the area. And those are how all the estate names, why they have these estate names. They actually were the addresses. Our next style is Italianate Revival, and that was from about 1899-1935. Um, some of the things that we look at here is a kind of a hipped roof. That's called a hipped roof when it goes across here. It doesn't go all the way out to the end. It just kind of chops off and goes down to the next wall over here. Um, there are, uh, get back to my notes here. We have wide overhangs, kind of full length arched windows, usually on the first floor. So you'll see that right there. That's a doorway. Some of these are entryways, windows there. And uh, usually clad in stucco. Now here's the original, here's some more examples. Somebody was asking earlier about the uh, um, Dayton Daily News building. Now this is the home of Levitt Luzerne Custer. I know you're all probably familiar with him if you're a volunteer here at the, uh, at the uh, at Dayton History. And uh, we're gonna go through some of his inventions, his thing here, but let's take a look at the house right now. It's in the Italianate style. It looks a lot like the Dayton Art Institute. However, that was designed by Edward Broadhead Green, and this was designed by Albert Pretzinger, who also designed the Dayton Daily News building downtown. This is obviously not a current picture because they just demolished that building back there in the process, now this, this, I believe this house was, or this building was uh, uh, built around 1912, maybe earlier than that. But around 1926, they added this on back here. And this was all the brouhaha lately where they started tearing that down and basically destroyed it. Had to bring the rest of that, just that section down. So this will still stand. And that's a, a iconic uh, building downtown Dayton. Uh, if you've ever, if you see photos from the 1913 flood, see that building. Also, um, when James M. Cox, the publisher, was looking for financing for a building and he got turned down by bank after bank after bank, he finally got the financing. And he went to Albert Pretzinger, and he's, Albert Pretzinger says, what kind of a building would you like? He said, give me something that looks like a bank. <laughs> so, there you have <laughs> And here we are, uh, here's uh, Mr. Custer right here. He was also a balloonist. He invented the uh, stratoscope, which is kind of a precursor to the, uh, uh, the altimeter of today's airplanes. And here's a picture of him doing a one-man balloon launch from the rival building. This is just before takeoff. Here he is getting ready, and, and he flew out over Dayton with a Dayton banner hanging down. He was a, a strong supporter of Dayton. Here he is with uh, a couple of other aviators, Al Johnson, Orville Wright, and test pilot John McCready. Now he also, as you all 
probably know, invented the electric wheelchair. And he did that in order to help, I don't know if I'm telling you guys anything, you, you, but in order to help veterans out at the VA center get to downtown Dayton, unfortunately, it only held enough power to get to downtown Dayton. <laughs> They'd have to go down in a, a car or something and, and pick up the poor guy and bring him in his chair back. So he also uh, invented the uh, Custer chairs. These later were also very popular on the boardwalk, walk in Atlantic City. And he invented the Custer car, which was another little gas-powered automobile. So you, usually you see kids in them, or you see a, a lovely model uh, riding one. I know we've got some of them over here in the, uh, the automotive building here at uh, uh, Dayton History. And a lot of Hollywood comedians used to like to drive around uh, hospitals. So you can see uh, Larry Moe and Curly Joe back there in a scene from some movie somewhere, and they're driving around. <laughs> Yes, Mark. Wh where was the, the Custer House? That photo you showed us. Uh, that's on uh, Shank Avenue. Um, you kind of go up the hill there, and it sits over to the right. And that house is what's known as a great room house. And uh, when you walk in the front door up here, you kind of go into a little entryway, and there's closets on either side. Then it opens up into a great room. Over over here is a dining room. I got a tour of this house once, wonderful. Over here was the dining room. Behind that was the kitchen. There was a maid's corner, back uh, quarters, back in the, that uh, far back corner back there. At the back of the house was kind of a den library. You come around this side of the house and there's uh, bathrooms and, uh, and bedrooms along this side, a little hallway off from the central room, but that was a, uh, the great room was in the middle, and that's where uh, you did most of your living. Here's a few more examples of Italian A revival. The next thing we're going to look at is the Georgian and Colonial Revival, and that goes from 1895 to uh, uh, present. And that architects wanted to evoke America's past uh, patriotism, so. They came up with these wonderful looking colonial style poems. Uh, usually they are what we call uh, symmetrical. So if you, it's kind of a mirror image on either side here, with the exception over here, we have a sleeping porch and a uh, sun parlor over here. But um, mostly they have these, um, this, you can tell them by the, often they'll have a, uh, columns here. Usually the porches are not too big but they will have these side lights, and what's known as a fan light, in these windows in the front entrance room. Um, also, there's uh, uh, a lot of classical details in the windows and uh, the dormers up here. So uh, it's a, a classical look. They still build houses like this up in Oakwood. You'll, you'll see some that are fairly recent. Here are some more. These are actually, uh, let's see, this one is in uh, this was the home of John M. Shantz, and that's in Shantz Park, but all, all three of these are in Schaefer Heights. And those, uh, that was a very popular style in Schaefer Heights. Our next home is uh, Spanish Revival. That was popular from 1890 to 1935. It's kind of an electric, eclectic mix of, inspired by the entire history of Spanish architecture. Uh, mission style evokes early California missions and has bell tower like feature. Usually has stucco walls and a low pitched uh, tile roof. Uh, the difference between a Spanish style house and a mission style house is a mission style, again, will have what's kind of a little feature that looks like a bell tower. And you'll see that kind of like right there, whereas some of these other ones do not have the uh, uh, bell tower. This home, this we talk about preservation. Part of preservation is maintaining the architectural integrity of a neighborhood, or when you do an addition to a house, you want to maintain the architectural integrity of that house. So um, this home here was just built, I think, probably within the last decade. It's over across from the, uh, the Dayton Country Club. So it is a new home but it fits right into the neighborhood. You would look at that and you would have thought it was built around 1927, but it was just built, I think, earlier, uh, around 2004. 
or something else. This is Chateau-esque. Uh, it kind of started off as what they call Second Empire, which is in reference, I believe, to Napoleon III era. But they did an addition to it that was uh, added this tower and added another room, or, I'm sorry, another uh, extension here. And uh, this man, this was known as a mansard roof. You got a, kind of goes up part way and then comes off flat here. Now the, this was the home of Isaac Haas, who was the, uh, one of the early developers of Oakwood. And this home was built around, uh, I think, 1880, 1892, somewhere around there, it was the late 1800s. And they used stone, if you're familiar with uh, Virginia Hollinger tennis courts up there in Oakwood, that's between uh, Schaefer and Shantz Avenue. And those are, that is a, uh, a tennis court, but at one time, that was a quarry. And uh, the stones that were used to build this house were quarried out of that area there where Virginia Hollinger tennis courts are. Um, another point about that is we get up into Oakwood, we have several parks up there, Roy Garden, Elizabeth Gardens, Hawk Stream. Those at one time were all gravel pits, and they were used in construction. And they were allowed them to wood in, and eventually there was uh, uh, John H. Patterson designed some trails up there, some horse riding trails, and was, eventually all became parks up there. But as you know, a lot of uh, a lot of the area around here is what's called moraine. It's just where the last glacier came down, stopped, dumped all of its Canadian gravel and stones and everything, and, and then receded. Hence, Moraine, Ohio. So this is Ravenswood. That's the name of the uh, estate. And that's uh, if uh, Mr. Haas needed some mail, it would just be sent to uh, Mr. Isaac Haas, Ravenswood, Dayton, Ohio. It'd get there. Our next style is Queen Anne. This is often referred to as Victorian because it was popular during the Victorian period, but the actual style is known as Queen Anne. 1880 to 1905 and uh, the things we notice about a Queen Anne style home is that it uh, usually has a turret feature like this it also has uh, uh, usually clapboard or shingle or both as we see shingle up here clapboard down here can everybody tell the details on this okay you seeing it okay from your angle and uh, so uh, some of Oakwood's earliest homes were in the Queen Anne style because it was so popular back in the 18, uh, uh, late 1800s. And this home uh, uh, also featured usually an irregular floor plan and roof shape. So you see things are not real symmetrical or asymmetrical. You see a lot of different angles there. And the tour is usually prominent on these homes that I had mentioned earlier. Here's another uh, Queen Anne house. This was a two-family home built by Adam Sean Sr. for family expansion. And we'll see another ex uh, example of this. But back in the day, when you were making the big bucks and you wanted to keep your family close, you could actually, uh, and help them out, you could actually build them a home. They could move, when they get married, they would move into this home, start their families, uh, eventually move out. So one of the, the Shantz, children would live on either side of this. So that is a two-family home. It's what called, what's called a double. A double is side by side. A duplex is up and down. But they're mostly called duplexes. Today, it's the 19, from the 50s on, they just call them duplexes. Tell them we said hello. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So that's a beautiful home. and. Uh, it's, it's had a new roof, I think, put on it. It's got a lot of those, those details. And you get kind of a double turret feature. Uh, here's some more uh, of those. So you can see the uh, turrets here, here, and here. This is the Howe Cutting Room Cottage, and it was built by Eliza P.T. Howe for family expansion. And that's what Howe Stream Park is named after. I'll show that there's single style, shingle style, which is basically pretty close to the Queen Anne, only it usually does, is usually fully clad in the shingles instead of clapboard. 
and those were popular 1874 to 1910. This house, uh, kind of a, a rare one in Oakwood, it's called Beaux Arts, and that usually came from the School of uh, Beautiful Arts in France. And it was a design, and uh, that one uh, is uh, check my notes here. Uh, American architects were inspired while studying in France's foremost architectural school, Ecole des Beaux-Arts, and spread French and Greek inspiration, elaborate detailing, a massive floor plan, and heavy masonry, and of course, a uh, satellite pitch. <laughs> <laughs> That's a rare style. It's the only one I think is in the uh, Beaux-Arts style. You all recognize this. Yes, it's my summer cottage in the Hamptons. <laughs> now, this is Hawthorne Hill. Mr. Orwell Wright, Hawthorne Hill, Dayton, Ohio, that's where I'm at. And this is what's known as neoclassical, very popular from 1895 to 1950. And um, it was inspired by the 1893's World Columbian Exposition in Chicago, which had a classical theme. So they went back to some of these Greek styles and Greek uh, details. So it's got a symmetrical facade, full height porch with columns and classical ornamentation. So uh, as you can see, the uh, Wright brothers were having this one built and it has, it's identical on both sides, front and back. They were both gonna have their own uh, uh, entrances, but Wilbur passed away before the home was completed. Uh, it started, I think, in 1912, and that was the year Wilbur passed away. It wasn't completed until about 1915 or 16. Here's, uh, this was the original home of Adam Schantz Sr., and this is on Schantz Avenue. This actually was an Italianate, started off, and then it got uh, transformed into a neoclassical by the addition of this roof with the columns. Here's another one. And this one back here as well. You probably can't see it, but that's a hawk that just happened to be flying over the day I took that photograph. Here's one a lot of people mistake as Art Deco, but it's not. If this were Art Deco, it looked like it was doing 80 just sitting there, right? more flowing lines and everything. This is a style called International. And uh, it was popular from 1932 to 1970. It was introduced in the U.S. in 1932. Uh, between World War I and World War II, Americans preferred traditional revival-style homes. Uh, European architects, however, were emphasizing radically new designs without historical precedence. Uh, clean lines prevailed, featured an asymmetrical facade, a flat roof, smooth, unornamented unorn wall surface, often in stucco, and it's rare in home, but most prominent in office buildings. The most re renowned international style buildings were the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center. And you see the, the, winter, the old Winters Bank building, uh, what do they call that now? It's a Chase Bank building, some downtown neighborhoods. The Kettering Tower, the Mead building down there, that's all in international style. It's kind of a big monolith looking type thing. Now, this home has another secret. It's made from steel panels, and it was an experimental home, and it was built in 1936 of insulated steel panels from the Insulated Steel, steel Buildings Company of Middletown. And the idea was abandoned when the onset of World War II, when steel production was prioritized toward the war effort. So all of those panels are not being eaten Turbines. Uh, the house next to it actually belonged to the family of a friend of mine. I was over there one day 40 years ago, and we're sitting on the couch, and he says, this house is made of steel. I said, what? And it was an interior uh, wall, and he said, yeah, it's made of steel. He took it to the It was clarn, clarn. By golly, it was steel. So there were several homes up there. There's, I think, three or four in Oakwood. And there's two of them right together. There's one on Shantz and one further down on uh, uh, Volusia. And I think there's been a couple more of them identified as well. So it was a great idea, but the onset of World War II prioritized the steel making for, uh, for the war effort. This is one of my favorite styles. It's Prairie, popular from 1900 to 1920. 
And it's an indigenous American style. If anybody ever asked, well, there's no real American architectural style. This is one of them. And it was attributed to Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, not this home, but the style. Uh, it's got a horizontal, the main thing about prairie homes are the horizontal aspect. You know when you look out over a prairie, everything is horizontal. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, and that's where Frank Lloyd Wright's inspiration was growing up in Illinois. If you've ever driven across Illinois, you know that a three hour trip takes about 20 hours because of the scenery. <laughs> but um, it uh, usually has an open floor plan. Uh, it's got the hip roof we see up here. So, you know, I mean, how do you make a straight line like that? And something horizontal way is kind of smooth it off and hip it. Um, even the chimney is wider than it usually is, so that helps to widen that up. Uh, how do you make a vertical porch post horizontal where you put these large <laughs> flat boards on it so you get kind of a horizontal effect there? Uh, same with the porch, it just kind of hit that up. Uh, there, just to highlight, I don't think you can really see it here, but there's a band around here that is just kind of helps highlight that horizontal aspect again. How do you make vertical windows uh, uh, horizontal? Well, you take, you, you put them together until that entire feature is now more horizontal than it is vertical. So there's three horizontal, or three windows in that one horizontal feature. So, uh, let's see if I missed anything. Clapboard usually on these to help with the horizontal look. Broad overhanging eaves here. That helps stretch it out even a little more. Have you all been up to the Westcott's, uh, Westcott yes. house up in Springfield? You see, he, he was so uh, uh, wanted, friend, that is an actual Frank Lloyd Wright house, and he so wanted to express that horizontal aspect that in the fireplace, all the mortar that's horizontal is darker than the mortar going vertical, so you get more of the flowing lines uh, horizontal that way. Let me see something. You see this tree back here? Back here? See all those vines on that? Those need to be removed. Those kill trees. And uh, so it's, it's, it's kind of a little gardening tip here. We always, we always plant this ivy and this, this ground cover, and then it starts growing up the tree, and we think, oh, we need a vine-covered tree. But that's killing the tree. It kills it a lot, a lot earlier than the life expectancy. When it gets growing up into uh, the side of our, our lovely little ivy-covered cottage, uh, the uh, roots or the rhizomes start digging into the mortar and the brick and start destroying that. So you want to keep it off your house, keep it off your trees, let it be a ground cover, what's great is a ground cover. But when that, you can see how out of control this one is. And I'm also in charge of grounds and facilities of the Oakwood Historical Society. And I've been fighting this stuff for a couple of years and I just made some major cuts in a couple of trees. But we just lost uh, 10 trees up there and a lot of them were weakened by the fact that they had all these vines growing up. So you want to get those off, you see. Because the trees do tend to fall on things, you know, cars, houses, people, so. This is another uh, uh, prairie style home, and this is more in a Frank Lloyd Wright style, but this is actually a Louis Lott house. And uh, it's right across the street from St. Paul's. And uh, so it's, prairie is, currently enjoying a uh, residential and commercial revival. So you're seeing a lot more prairie, newer prairie houses, homes, and uh, office buildings actually being built. Anybody got the time real quick? It's three, three o'clock. Right Did anybody want, need to take a break or anything? We've got about another 20 minutes or so. Maybe less. This is another one of my favorite styles, the American bungalow. The bungalow is actually a housing style to which other architectural artistic styles are applied. So this is what's known as a craftsman style house. These are the exposed rafter tails up here, these tape on the porch posts. This house is on wheelchair. You get a broad front porch here. It comes from the old term for bungalow from, uh, from India, from uh, when the British Empire, India was part of the British Empire. 
And uh, they, those houses usually had porches that went around three or four sides of the house. But the American bungalow has just one broad front porch. Those porches, porches are, uh, back in the day, it was a, um, an additional living space. I can remember when I was a kid, uh, we used to set out on our front porch. And then we could see you, uh, the, the houses were so aligned that you could sit on your front porch and look up every front porch on your street. And of course, you could see the ones across the street. And you would wave to your neighbor and bring them over. And the Denzels would come over and step across and have a, have a drink. You know, we sit there and talk, have a great time. So uh, front porches were additional living spaces. It's what you did on a summer evening before television and, uh, and uh, the internet and everything else. I thought I read on uh, front porches and got from Africa. Africa and that was the first thing I read about the that may well be, uh, but the bungalow is from the India bungalow, oh, and it, but it is, yeah, yeah. Front yeah. yeah. From porch to the, right. I thought I heard it was from that. Probably ancient, well, way back, I mean, they had front porch. Well, the way from the, from the, from the slaves, <coughs> yeah. they ended up just being front porch, right? Oh, okay. See, I learned something every day. Thank you. Uh, here's a few more here in Oakwood. Uh, this is, uh, Craftsman style bungalow in Sean's Park. Um, this one down on Wiltshire, Craftsman style. This is a rare airplane bungalow, and it's referred to that because the lower roofs are kind of spread out and uh, they kind of resemble wings. And then there's a small room at the top or a small section, and that's kind of like a cockpit. So when they design these airplanes, or I'm sorry, they, these bungalows back then, they referred to them as airplane bungalows because somebody thought they looked kind of like. Now, back again, we were talking about the colors from nature, and that's the craftsman style. And here's a couple of homes that, that are have been restored, and they are in its proper colors. This home is magnificent, and it's a, it doesn't have, a bungalow doesn't have to be small to be a, a bungalow. Uh, the biggest bungalows we see are the ones designed by Green and Green in Pasadena, California, and that is the Gamble House is considered a bungalow, an ultimate bungalow, but a bungalow. This house is actually in Kettering down on Lennox. It was built in 1913. It used to sift way back in the woods. And uh, it uh, had a long driveway that went back there. Then they developed up the area back in the 50s and the 60s. And so this house kind of stands there by itself, kind of sticks out by what I like to refer to as a beautiful sore thumb. So it's uh, very well done and uh, the people are uh, Arts and crafts collectors. They uh, they furnished it with mission style furniture and things like that. We're going to take a look at pattern homes or catalog homes. Now, it used to be you could order a house from Sears or Aladdin or Montgomery Ward, and they would uh, they would ship you all the parts. You could either build it yourself, have somebody build it, but it would come usually with a barrel full of nails. Every piece had a number on it, so you could put it together like a puzzle, and uh, with the instructions. And here we see the Ellsmore, and that was uh, that's the ad for it. And here's that house on Telford in Oakland. And if you're interested in those, SearsArchives.com or AntiqueHome.org house plans. And uh, so there's uh, those were kind of convenient. To, uh, ways of purchasing a house and keeping the cost down. Here's a few more. These are also in Oakwood. This is the Martha Washington. Where you're not going to buy a house at that price anymore. <laughs> and this one's the Sunbeam. There's, I think, three of these in Oakwood. There's only one of these, but it's, uh, uh, you can see it is the, the uh, this is more of a colonial revival. This is more of a long bundle. Yes? What? What is the time limit or time when this was happening? These are usually the tw about the 1920s, okay. usually uh, teens, 20s, and 30s. Up into the yes. And then, what were the walls like? Did they come together in a truck or no? They actually everything came just in a package. And, and back in the day, this was probably delivered to your house, to your property, right. on a horse-drawn wagon. 
but all the all the parts would be separate. Nothing would be complete. Yeah, so they have to put it together. They have to put the but whole thing together. But what is what is the material of the walls? Well, uh, plaster on the inside. Uh -huh. Now, uh, actually, some of these actually could be a, a, a drywall because drywall was starting to become popular back around the twenties and the thirties. So it could have been, but I think I, usually you had to have a plaster maybe come in and do it. So that's a very good question, of which I'm not going to make up any more than I just did. Okay. So. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And here's another home. This was, we just identified this about uh, not quite two years ago in Oakwood. Uh, there's the actual home. Here's the ad for Blue Ribbon Homes. Mm -hmm. These were called uh, builders, builder's houses. And they would kind of give you an idea. It wouldn't be a complete kit, but they would cut the wood and everything. It was an idea of a home to build. And some people took the idea and had it built. Another one of my favorites, the English Cottage, is actually kind of a smaller version of the English Tudor. And you still had the nice accents and the steep roof. And uh, you can see a little bit of a dormer out here that kind of resembles that cross uh, gable. But uh, these were popular from about 1890 to 1930, and they were uh, more of a, 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 a lower class, but more of a middle class, working man's tutor type home. I know you know this guy. Yeah. Yeah, this is the original home of Joseph Ardesh. So on Greenmont, you probably all heard the story of how he had to have a, uh, uh, as they were building the uh, uh, code breaking machine, down at NCR, and it was so top secret that he actually had to have a, uh, a an officer stay with the family to make sure everything was good because he was German and uh, he was a you know full hearted American, but he would have German blood in, so they wanted to make sure everything was uh, okay with uh, Joe. So um, I know you all know this book, and. Uh, that was his original home, and I actually drove by one day. There were some people sitting out there, and they said, "You know, this is the home of a famous guy." They go, "Yeah," because <laughs> it's a kind of a, a, you know, it's kind of a, uh, a kind of a modest home, nothing real fancy about it. And uh, here's another example of the English cottage type. Well, this one's not down on that. <coughs> a couple of years ago, I got a book, and it was called. Uh, Arts and Crafts Exteriors. And it had this ad in it for a Creo dipped thatch roof. It was not a real thatch roof, it just kind of looked like a thatch roof. But I noticed this down here, it says House in Chance Park, uh, development, Dayton, Ohio, architect Louis Lott, Dayton. So uh, I said, what the heck? And uh, I actually went over to the house. I, I basically that minute jumped in a car when looking for this house and uh, oops, found it on Orlando Terrace in Oakwood, just off of Irving. And this is the house. And I went in and visited these people. They were very nice. And they actually even had a, uh, a copy of Building Age magazine from 1913. Uh, actually, it was a copy of it. And uh, it also featured the house. So it was kind of a, a neat house. And uh, it's... Uh, not real fancy either. It's kind of a neat little English cottage. <laughs> okay, this is a Dutch colonial revival. Now, back, uh, again, this is a revival, but uh, back in the, uh, <clears throat> these were popular in 1900, 1935. Uh, popular with the middle class, suburban families. And it's based on an earlier Hudson River area style of the late 80s century. Now the design was inspired to reduce taxes. When you had a bigger, uh, when you had a two-story house, a full two-story house, you had to uh, uh, pay more taxes. But if you had a house that just had a dormer, dormers up here, you didn't have to pay so much taxes because that was considered a story of a house. So what they would do colonial, a Dutch colonial house. First off, they would put this uh, uh, angled, uh, they would expand the area up here by angling the roof coming here and then cutting down like that, but they'd put this very
very wide dormer on here that didn't quite go to the edge down here of the first floor, but basically gave you a second story for the same tax price as a, as a, as a one story. So that's where the whole idea of the Dutch Colonial came from. Yes. What do you know about that window on the roof there? Is that an eye, eyebrow? Yeah, that's called an eyebrow window, and that's just there to, uh, it can open and, and give a little ventilation to that hot air out of the attic, but also if you're going up to the attic and add some, some light up there without having to, uh, you know, have light up there. But this house was built, let's see, I think in uh, around 1916, the first fully electric houses in the Dayton area weren't really until about, I think, sometime in the 1930s. Now, you would have maybe one electrical outlet for a lamp in your living room and maybe one or two in your kitchen. But other than that, when you went up to the bedrooms, you, you just still have a, a candles or a, a oil lamp. So, uh, the first, like we call it, a fully electric house, not until they almost the mid things. So yeah, it is a good good call on bringing that up. It's called an eyebrow window. <laughs> and I like using this house. This was the home of uh, Ralph G. Rossell, who was the main architect of Schaefer Heights. And this is that house back then. But I want you to notice something. Notice the, sh the shutters and the uh, shutters up here and the light fixtures and there they are almost a hundred years later these light fixtures I'm a big fan of the old light fixtures they always seem to have more artwork to them They're very craftsman you know obviously made by crafts people and uh, it's always good to get them rewired every now and then so they're not a hazard and get the electricity modern electricity into them. but uh, they look great they're oftentimes more expensive than uh, newer lights, but they're less expensive than lights that are intentionally revival type lights made to look like them. You can find these online. People are constantly uh, redoing houses and taking down old lights, or taking out old windows, and sometimes you can find architectural uh, uh, revival type houses, salvage places. And again, Ralph G. Russell designed many of the homes in Chicago. Here's a few more examples. This is uh, here's one where we don't actually have that uh, uh, broken roof line like this one. But here's uh, these are actually uh, what are called four squares, and it just kind of has the design uh, uh, feature there. It's actually a full size, it's just kind of made to look like a Dutch cafe. And here is an American four square. This is kind of the bigger brother of the. Uh, American Bungalow. This is kind of a two-story version of the American Bungalow. It's actually a, uh, a housing style to which other architectural designs can be applied. So this one's a little on the prairie side, uh, as is this one. This one's more craftsman here. You see the exposed rafter tails. Those are pretty, uh, pretty elaborate, actually, there. This was the original home. J. Edward and Emma Johns Sauer, and she was the, the daughter of Adam <coughs> Johns Jr., who uh, actually developed Johns uh, Park. This is French Eclectic, and uh, 1915 to 1945. This was also another former Philharmonic Volunteers Home, Showcase Home, uh, a couple years back. And uh, it's got a little more of the French uh, accents to it almost craftsman, but, uh, and kind of a, a mix of all these, but uh, usually uh, accentuated by uh, these floor to ceiling windows. And uh, we will move on now. Sorry, I haven't given this. <laughs> hey there, are both of those chimneys, like would both of those fireplaces actually be in working order? Yeah, those were, and that was how you heated a home at the time. So, the, uh, another thing about the American Four Square, uh, the advent of that home was because of the uh, advent of the central heating system. We now had a, usually back then, a coal fireplace at the big octopus arms that came 
of uh, now your basement. And uh, so you would have central heating and uh, instead of fireplaces. These were probably, even for the time this home was built, the fireplaces were probably more decorative. Uh, we're there for decoration, even though you could heat with them, this probably still had a central heating uh, system. Has anybody here had a career in uh, real estate? Good for you, I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> Whenever you look at a, a house in uh, Oakwood or anywhere else, uh, you'll often see that it's listed as a Cape Cod. And that's because they go to the Montgomery County website, and if they had one of these books, they know a little better about what an architectural style is. I always say you're kind of like you know, you call up, you're, you're a GM salesman, somebody calls up and says, uh, hey, I want to buy a Cadillac, and they say, well, all I got is a GM car, so, well, okay, hang on, you got half, you got a Buick, you got a Cadillac, you got a Chevy. Same thing, uh, somebody calls up and says, hey, I'm looking for, I'm looking for a really nice craftsman style bundle, and they say, and they'll take a look at their list and they say, oh, all I got is Cape Cod, so they go, oh, okay, I'll keep them. They may have a bunch of American craftsman bungalows for sale, but they don't know it because they go to the Montgomery County website and somebody over there, if they didn't know what it was, and it was a story or a story and a half, they just called it a Cape Cod. It's probably a, a Williamsburg like this one down here, and I'll show you the differences here on that. But, uh, you know, they have a, a it might be an English cottage, or I even saw a, a craftsman foursquare once listed as a Cape Cod. <laughs> almost hit the ceiling. <laughs> and uh, so these were popular from 1925 to 1955. How you can tell one, and there's only two or three in Oakwood, but it would have a small porch entryway. The chimney would be toward the center of the house to, for the heat, you know, kind of a, uh, to keep the, uh, the house warm uh, in the living room. And uh, there would be no dormers. Now, catty corner to this one across the street, these are on Schaefer Boulevard. This one is what's known as a Williamsburg. It has the dormers, still has a small front porch, but the chimney is moved to the side because now we do have central uh, heating. But you'll see a lot of houses listed as a Cape Cod. That's why I, I dig on the realtors when I get this presentation. Our next one uh, is the mid-century modern, so you know, park the T-Bird in the carport, mix the martinis, put Sinatra on the high five. <laughs> and these were popular from 1945 to about 1965. These have been, this style is making an incredible comeback right now. And a lot of people are buying the original ones or having their own built. Uh, this one is uh, architecturally, was architecturally styled, much like, uh, uh, actually both of those probably are, but much like Frank Lloyd Wright would design all of the furniture on the inside and, uh, and, uh, and you know, the interior, not only the exterior, but the interior. That's what this house had. And I don't know if it's still like that or not, but it was architecturally designed. In fact, I believe the original architect lived in that house. And if you're interested in that era, like I say, it's really making a comeback right now. Uh, in Sometime in February is a 20th century sale down in Cincinnati. It's one of the biggest sales for mid-century modern furniture and, uh, and uh, decorative arts. So Modern Magazine, Atomic Ranch Magazine are two of the magazines that support this style. Again, it's getting very popular. So there's a kind of a revival going on. This is the ranch style. This one's in uh, Sean's Park. You'll notice as you go up Sean's Avenue or most any of the streets in there, you're going to see some of these classic older houses. And then all of a sudden, you're going to see one or two ranch style houses. Well, during the Depression, all of the um, uh, development slowed down in Oakwood. And uh, then Adam Sean's Jr. passed away, and all of these open lots were caught up in, in uh, litigation. So by the uh, 50s and 60s, that was all taken care of. They started building houses again. The architectural styles had changed to ranch style. And most of these ranch styles are architecturally designed and uh, very well laid out. And 
and uh, makes them for some pretty nice homes, and they are uh, very popular from 1945 to about 1975. Um, this is the uh, headquarters of the Oakwood Historical Society. This is another example of a transformation. We talked about uh, Adam Sean Sr. house transformed from an Italianate to a uh, neoclassical. Same thing happened here. This was what was known as a, a gabled L. It had a, a section here and another kind of a cross gable there. He's either a, made a T design or an L design. And it was vernacular. They would use uh, all the materials from around the property. They'd go out, cut the wood, and build the house. They, in fact, when this house was built in about 1864, I believe, uh, there was a uh, the clay from the property was used to make the bricks. They actually had a, a kiln on the, the other side of Far Hills, and uh, over there they actually made the bricks. Well, they wanted to expand the house around 1917, and they did. And uh, Prairie was uh, popular with it, so they added kind of a Prairie addition. So you can still see this little window is still there. This side of the house. This, this house fits right in here, and then it was expanded out that way, giving more emphasis on the horizontal aspect. So that is our house museum at 1947 Far Hills Avenue, the Long Romsburg Homestead. And um, uh, again, this was a, a transformation, so uh, the transformation was completed around 1920. So, Here's a little bit of our, a few of our upcoming events at the Oakwood Historical Society. We're having a taste of wine and cheese on Saturday, May 17th. Also our classics on the lawn, car show and open house will be on the 24th. You can go to our, and these are both being held along Romsburg Homestead House Museum, but you can go to our uh, oakwoodhistory.org for details of all of our upcoming events. We have several more uh, uh, talks coming up. And uh, for example, the next one I'm going to be doing in the spring of 20, well, actually I'll be doing it down at uh, UDLLI in, uh, I believe in April, we haven't set the exact date yet, at least they haven't told me. It's called the Mound Builders, and we'll take a look, kind of an in-depth look. There's a lot of amazing things being discovered and uh, unearthed, shall we say, uh, for uh, the uh, Ohio's incredible history of ancient Americans. Any questions? Yes? With your prestigious title, I wonder if you could prevail upon RTA to change the recording on the buses with, which say Shantz Avenue. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out Skink or Shink or uh, Shantz Avenue. Avenue. I'll see what I can do. Uh, it's mostly a prestigious title. <laughs> yes? I was kind of fascinated by the chimney pots that you showed. Yes. Are those the original? And do, if they were damaged, do we have uh, craftsmen in this area that can? You can probably, those, those were original on that house, I'm sure, but yeah, you can actually find those usually in architectural salvage or some of these uh, concrete places that actually deal in clay, brick, and things like that can make those for you. If one got damaged, and, uh, and they're pretty durable, but if one got damaged, they could actually probably make you one to match that. So, I would imagine that. Yes? So do the, the people that live in these particular style homes, um, are they uh, passionate about keeping their <coughs> homes looking like the way they are yeah. supposed to look? Yeah, they're, they're kind of, uh, uh, well, uh, seriously, about 15 years ago, we started up the Oakwood Preservation Trust. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people thought we were trying to make laws to tell people what to do with their houses. Well, we found that programs like this where you educate someone, they become more appreciative of what they've got and learn more about it. Because a lot of people don't know, I, just, I still talk to people who think they're living in a Cape Cod. You know, I was in a, at a party the other night up in Oakwood and uh, they lived in a nice little Williamsburg type house and she said, yeah, this is a, we bought it in Cape Cod. 
if I can argue with you, this is a nice party. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, the people are becoming more and more aware, and, uh, and that's a good thing. Education, is, as you all probably know, is, is what really matters. And you can't really go around waving your finger in people's faces and telling them what they should be doing. You just need to kind of nudge them over to what, what, what really is appropriate. And if they like it, great. And if they don't, they want to keep it the same or let it fall apart or paint it purple. You know, that's kind of their own choice. Yes? The uh, shingles that were used on the homes, I, they kind of resemble the ones from the East Coast that would be, they would turn gray as a result of salt water. Yes, uh, these were usually painted in this area, but yeah, you're absolutely correct. Those were, and they're usually made of cedar, right. which as you know is a very durable wood, and those weather out nicely, usually the shingle type homes over on the, on the East Coast, and because of the salt air and the exposure, uh, those actually become very uh, durable with age, and you know, if they get damaged, instead of replacing an entire half a wall, you can replace the shingles done that up at the Historical Society. We've got, we own the house next door and up on the dormers in the attic, uh, they are in shingle. And we were able to find some shingles that match. If I get some of them that fall out or something, I'll just paint them over and slap them in there. Yes? On that house that had the uh, fake Cotswold uh, thatch roof, was yes. that still that picture? Was that still that original one? Yes, uh, actually it's, it's been done with asphalt. That was the Creo, Creo soda, I think, or whatever they yeah, call it. Creo soda. And um, now it's it's in asphalt, but it still has the same design that you're not put gutters over it. Just let the rain or the ball actually dirt. Is it not true that there's no protection for a house like Hawthorne Hill the Wright Brothers house? That anyone that buys that or owns it right now can tear it down for any reason and put up condos or whatever they like. Uh, thank you, Miss. That's a very astute observation. <laughs> That's my wife, by the way. She keeps an eye on me and makes sure I, I cover everything. Yes, when you get a designation as a historic district or a, a building is put on the National Register of Historic Places, that is more of a, an honor type of a designation. It's up, up, kind of up to the um, local jurisdiction to set laws as to what colors you can, should paint it and what you should do to the house. So it starts off as, a, as an honorable designation, but then it kind of ends up that the local uh, laws would apply. But often you don't need to do that when you've educated people and they say, oh, I live in a you know, a nice little craftsman home. Well, I'm going to pick up a, a copy of a uh, American Bungalow magazine and take a look at what I can and should do. It's, uh, it's more like education, but uh, sometimes uh, we find you catch more flies with uh, honey than you do with vinegar. So that's what we just kind of choose to go out and just kind of spread the word on. Yes. Does uh, the city of Oakwood have a housing inspector that can? Uh, you know, say, hey, you can't do that, or? Yes, he's more based toward, um, you know, the safety features and the systems of the home and making sure there's uh, handrails, you know, broken windows are repaired or cracked windows are repaired. Uh, the, um, you know, broken steps are repaired, things like that. But we, we have a zoning uh, board that they do a little more people submit plans for a house and they will you know either prove it or they'll make other suggestions or flat out deny it if it's, if it's they're trying to put a box on, on a uh, you know a queen Anne house um, and they'll just make suggestions to try and make it better so uh, there really is no law if they have a guideline as to what the proper, uh, you know, housing styles, uh, architectural features would be, colors and things like that. But if you want to paint your house purple, obviously you can. Just want to yes. figure out how far it is. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Is there still a demand for these homes in Oakwood? I know. Um, 
as you pointed out, some of the many of these homes were built a hundred years ago, and yeah. they're in pristine condition because the owners kept them that way. There's an equal number of homes in Oakwood that we know that need several hundred thousand dollars of upgrade work, and is there still demand for those? Yes, there are. Uh, surprisingly enough, in fact, a lot of those homes can be updated on the inside, and they choose to kind of just keep it all original looking on the outside because you want to have a modern kitchen and you want to have modern bathrooms and you want the bedroom to look nice and things like that. Um, now when it comes to windows, some of them are so far gone, uh, but I saw a, an ad last year, it was I think for Gilkey Windows or something, if you were for Gilkey, I apologize. But they, they came on and said, this house was built in the 1990s, it's time for new windows. And they're like, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, and it didn't run for long because I think they, they realized, you know, how am I going to sell these people windows that are only going to last for 20 years? I've got my, our windows are 85 years old. But we could use some good storms, but if you put a good storm window on the outside, those and you can there's people who tighten up the old windows and put new weights and ropes in them and things like that, and they'll they'll, they'll do you fine. You get that dead air insulation when you have the storm window and the original windows, and a lot of those. A lot of those new windows are pretty good, but you have to keep in mind that metal uh, expands and contracts at a rate seven times more than the glass does. So when you buy those double pane windows and you get all that movement in there, though it's very microscopic, eventually those seals give out. You start getting that condensation of between the panes, and that's what causes that. Yes? I have a friend, speaking of windows, who um, lived in Oakwood, she moved several years ago to a tutor in Kettering, up um, like across from the Kettering Hospital and up that hill. Yep. Some big tutors up there. Yeah. And she had a person come in and repair all of the, um, what is that called again? The leaded glass. The leaded glass. Yeah. Every single window in her house. I bet that was yeah, but I mean, they wanted to keep the home looking exactly as it should, uh -huh. and so they went to that to that extent to do so. Yeah, uh, I actually knew a fellow who was restoring uh, the, the, the lot, uh, Ellison uh, Smith was an architect, and he did a lot of these cosmic cottages. And uh, I knew a fellow who was restoring his house. But he couldn't at the time; he couldn't find anybody that would do that leaded glass work in date. He eventually ended up having a custom piece made that uh, it was double paint glass, but it had the design on the between the glass. It was easier to clean, but eventually it seals it. Okay, anything else? Well, we want to thank you so much for coming.